Good day everyone, this is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar and today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, something that is is made uh, the recent news headlines and um, you know, at least for the last couple of years or so it has becoming kind of an emerging problem that, that we're going to be uh, dealing with on a more and more frequent basis uh, in uh, as pre-hospital providers and certainly as emergency uh, room providers and even um, intensive care um, providers and then obviously um, you have other issues such as uh, rehabilitation, um, counseling, social work and, and so on and so forth. There's a really large constellation of um, healthcare providers that are potentially uh, going to be involved with this and this is, um, this is really nothing new. Uh, fundamentally it's nothing new and, and it is um, about substance abuse. Uh, clearly, substance abuse isn't anything particularly new to humanity. Um, you know, as basically as far back as we have written uh, language, um, you can find evidence of substance abuse, abuse, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, in that in that regards, is really nothing new. But um, the the substance substances rather um, that we see kind of emerging are, are somewhat new, but we really look at them, and that's what I kind of want to do today, is just to kind of superficially at least look at the chemistry of these new substances, or one of them in particular, just simply because um, the structure of a molecule in question is is reasonably easy for me to draw <laughs> um, and, ex and explain uh, with my limited uh, knowledge of, of organic chemistry, um, so that's what I'm going to do. So the substance that uh, that I want to talk about is um, uh, collectively, at least in the United States, collectively um, goes by the street name of bath salts. Now bath salts are um, can contain numerous substances. I'm going to talk about one of the, the the substances that we find in certain bath salt mixtures, but I think we need to uh, recognize and understand that there really isn't a you know a quote unquote quote unquote standard formulation for these, these bath salts and that they can contain uh, numerous um, substances and, and the concentrations of those various substances can probably vary pretty significantly from batch to batch and, and obviously there will be some other concepts that I'll talk about here in a little bit such as the uh, enanth enantiomer and you know what type of molecule do I am I looking at and you know does that have some bearing on, on what goes on? I would probably say yes. Um, however, I haven't really seen a whole lot of literature out there on this, and it's, it's relatively new. Um, so when we talk about bath salts, it's all over the news. We've seen uh, some fairly recent uh, things occur that have really highlighted this bath salt issue and kind of pushed it to the front of, of the uh, news, if you will. But um, it's been around at least for a couple of years. <coughs> um, Bath salt abuse is nothing new in Europe, particularly the United Kingdom. Um, they've been dealing with uh, these types of substances. Uh, these are called, kind of fall into the class of medications known as uh, quote unquote designer drugs. These are synthetically uh, designed medications or drugs um, that you can make in a laboratory. Uh, things like crystal meth, uh, methamphetamine, ecstasy, MDMA. Um, LSD, PCP, um, all kind of more or less fall into this synthetic um, drug. Um, and what I mean by synthetic is that we're, we're, we can actually, we're, we as human beings are synthesizing uh, these substances versus um, finding a substance in a plant or a plant or an animal um, and having that plant or animal. Um, you know, extracting the substance or having a plant or animal make the substance. Um, so that's kind of the differentiation I'm making. But uh, when we when we talk about bath salts, uh, what do we, what kind of effects do we see? Well, um, let's just talk about kind of one of the the molecules or one of the substances that we find in, in these bath salts mixtures, and that is a substance known as as mephedrone. Okay. So I again bad art, but uh, I, I think it'll work for this. So this is uh, mephedrone here. Let me uh, move up a little closer. So this is mephedrone here, and what we have is I've actually labeled uh, some of the significant parts. I have a, a benzene ring here. Um, some people call this an aromatic ring. Uh, this is synonymous, synonymous uh, terminology. So I have a benzene ring here. I have what's called a methyl group. 
comes off of this. And um, of course, in organic chemistry, when we draw these old stick figure diagrams, you can assume that uh, kind of these old points here are carbons. You know, we don't actually draw a C for every carbon. It's just a um, implied that that's a carbon. So this is a methyl group that comes off of the, this carbon here, hydrogen, um, benzene ring. Uh, these lines indicate electron resonance, which we see in the benzene ring. Okay, uh, and again, I have kind of this this little backbone here, and these are, are carbon atoms, and it's just applied that we know they're there. I have a double covalent bond in oxygen. Uh, this is called a ketone group. Okay, and then I have a hydrogen and nitrogen here. And whenever I see uh, nitrogen in um, a carbon backbone. Um, that's almost always going to be a, what we call an, am an amine or amide, um, if you're talking about proteins, but in this case it's an amine. And then I have another methyl group that comes off the amine here. This little squiggly line here just indicates um, that this molecule has a, an enantiomer, and basically what that means is that um, the molecule has two forms, sometimes more, but when we talk about enantiomers, we're talking about two forms, and there's a left-hand form, in a right-handed form. Okay, it's the same number of atoms, the same general structure, it's just a, um, a left-hand and a right-hand structure, and um, depending on the type of enantiomer that you're dealing with, you can have significantly different effects occur occurring. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, and I don't know that we have a great understanding of does uh, one the right-handed enantiomer of mephedrone have certain effects and the left-handed enantiomer of mephedrone have other effects. Um, it's almost certainly the case because we see um, enantiomers of other uh, drugs have pretty significant um, different, significantly different effects. So I would assume the case is true with mephedrone. Now along with mephedrone there are other substances in bath salts, okay? This is just one of the easier ones. The, the chemically it's, it's easy to visualize, it's fairly easy for me to explain as well, again, with my, my rather basic understanding of organic chemistry. Okay, so mephedrone, well, let's compare mephedrone to substances that uh, have been around for a little while and we know a little bit more about them. So, what I'm going to do is, you can see mephedrone here, this is a substance called methamphetamine, or meth. Okay. We're all familiar with methamphetamine, at least in the United States. Uh, certainly, in the southwest United States where I live, methamphetamine is a huge problem. It belongs to a class of medications known as a stimulants, and also has some crossover uh, with hall hallucinogens. It has some hallucinogenic effects. If you look at these two molecules, these are very similar. Methadrone is very similar to, to methamphetamine. I have... Um, my benzene ring. Okay, I I do not have the methyl group that I do here. Um, I've got my carbon backbone. I've got my amine, and I have a methyl group that comes off of there. Um, uh, you can see that I am lacking the ketone group here um, in methamphetamine that I do have in meth methadone. Uh, one thing to note is this little methyl group here and here, and you actually see it down here in ecstasy. Um, the methyl group is really rather interesting because it helps these substances penetrate the blood-brain barrier. These are very easily capable of penetrating the blood-brain barrier, so these substances ha are highly active in the central nervous system. Okay. Now, if I were to look at something called amphetamines, okay, so not methamphetamines, but amphetamine, well. Um, an amphetamine, a methamphetamine is just an amphetamine with a methyl group here. So if I were to take this methyl group off, let's see if I can uh, cut that off there, <clears throat> that would be called amphetamine. Um, now amphetamine um, can penetrate the blood-brain barrier, but it is not um, as, uh, as um, efficient, if you will, as getting through and, and causing profound central nervous effect, system effects like methadrone, meth methamphetamine. Um, if you look down here at ecstasy, um, you see it has the same um, methyl group here. Uh, ecstasy, as we know, it can easily penetrate um, the blood-brain barrier, has pretty profound hallucinogenic effects in some cases. Um, you have some differences here. I have what's called an acetyl group. 
that comes off of the benzene ring and I have a covalent bond with an oxygen, covalent bond with an oxygen here, and of course I have a carbon bond here. Um, but again, the, the main structure, the core structure of ecstasy is still very similar to methamphetamine, is very similar to methadrone. Okay, so now we talked about a little bit about the basic chemistry. <clears throat> what should we expect to see in bath salt um, abuse or use? Well, we would expect to see methamphetamine-like effects. Uh, chemically, they're very, a very uh, these substances are very similar to methamphetamines. We should see methamphetamine effects. So, um, we talk about toxidromes. Uh, I actually did a little video on toxidromes earlier. Um, we know that methamphetamines fall into the uh, what we call the sympathomimetic uh, toxidrome. So, I would uh, expect uh, significant sympathomimetic effects occur in my patient. Um, expect things like um, um, tachycardia, um, elevated uh, blood pressure. Um, perhaps diaphoresis, uh, perhaps um, a pupillary dilation, increased uh, respiratory rate. Okay, so some, some pretty significant what we call autonomic or sympathomimetic or sympathetic uh, nervous system effects. In addition, we should expect some pretty profound central nervous system effects. Um, particularly, what we find is we find that these types of medications um, inhibit the reuptake of. Um, specific neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters like uh, norepinephrine, dopamine. Um, and what does that do? Well, we know that these neurotransmitters are associated with um, mood and we can have changes in mood. Uh, particularly, we can have increased um, alertness um, that actually goes all the way to severe anxiety. We can have um, altered uh, mental status and in the form of, of extreme anxiety, paranoia. And these things are, are, are certainly not unfamiliar to us, especially if you're in emergency medical services or emergency room and you see patients that abuse uh, methamphetamines. You know, a lot of these patients have pretty significant um, sympath sympathomimetic effects. Uh, they often have um, significant central nervous system effects. Um, they're agitated, they're anxious. Uh, what we're finding in some of the these bath salts abuses, we're finding some pretty significant central nervous system effects, and I would I would venture to say that this is probably due to the certain mixtures of these substances we have, and probably the amounts of isomers or uh, enantiomers that we find. You know, perhaps there's more um, right or left-handed, and that has perhaps one of those enantiomers has more CNS effects than, say, um, autonomic effects. Um, obviously, that's just a guess um, at this point. Um, so we're seeing, you know, significant hallucinations, lots of hallucinating, lots of hallucinogenic type effects that you'd see in LSD. Um, obviously, these patients become very violent, as we've seen in recent news stories. Um, and um, they may be insensitive to pain stimuli. Um, and what I mean by that is you may, again, you know, going back to news, you may shoot somebody, and if you shoot somebody like me, who has a relatively normally functioning central nervous system, I recognize uh, that pain stimuli coming in, and, um, you know, I might be um, neutralized, if you will, uh, much quicker than somebody who isn't really capable of uh, consciously um, recognizing uh, that pain stimuli or you know, what they are, um, you know, what's going on with them. Uh, so violence is definitely a big issue. How would we treat somebody like this in a pre-hospital setting? You know, specifically because I've talked about pre-hospital in emergency room. Well, really, the, the the big thing is obviously safety. You know, if you, you get on scene and there's somebody that's um, pretty crazy acting uh, very violently like this, you know, you're going to need to pull back, and you're needed. You're going to need to get help, I mean, police officers, and you may need to um, uh, chemically or physically restrain this person, depending on how um, aggressive they are. Um, and we would treat this bath salts very similar to methamphetamines, you know, anti-anxiolytics, uh, your benzodiazepines, um, you may need to administer IV fluids if they have, if they're hyperthermic, you know, you may need to give a fluid bolus for dehydration. Um, uh, you're going to, again, going back to um, anti-anxiolytic medications are really going to be kind of the mainstay um, treatment uh, in, in addition to monitoring, looking at serum electrolytes, you're going to need to treat uh, the central nervous system issues. 
Okay, guys, um, as always, thanks for hanging in there.